What do Homer's Cyclops, the philosopher Aristotle, and Spartan warriors in training all have in common? Cheese. Hey there, cheese historians! I'm Julia, and this is Cheese History, a channel all about the origins, history, and impact of cheese. Today's episode is going to be about cheese in the world of ancient Greece. Greek civilization developed in several stages, the first of which is the Mycenaean civilization, which lasted from around 1600 to 1100 BC. Mycenaean Greece was the first advanced and organized civilization on the Greek mainland, um, but it was preceded by the Minoan civilization on the island of Crete. Now, the Minoan civilization began to decline around about the same time the Mycenaean civilization began to have more influence and spread out across mainland Greece. Crete ended up becoming part of the Mycenaean civilization, so there are suggestions that the Mycenaeans may have had some part to play in the downfall of the Minoans. Mycenaean Greece is centered on the southern parts of the Greek peninsula as well as the island of Crete, and it gets its name from one of its major centers, Mycenae, which is an important archaeological site for the history of Greece in this era. We don't know all that much about the Mycenaeans, unfortunately, but what we do know is that like the Sumerians, they were offering cheese to gods and goddesses. And some of these gods and goddesses are kind of familiar to us as they become part of the later Greek pantheon, including Poseidon, the god of the sea. Somewhere between 1200 and 1100 BC, the Mycenaean civilization mysteriously collapses. There's a lot of debate among historians as to whether this was caused by internal strife or external invasion. Either way, the Greek Dark Ages begin. This is a period of several hundred years where we know very little about what was happening in Greece. The land of Greece is not really that suited for keeping herds of cattle. Instead, it's ideal for sheep and goats. It's not surprising then that a lot of ancient Greek cheeses are made from either sheep or goat's milk. It's not really clear when the two great works of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were written, but the tentative consensus is that it was probably somewhere around the 9th century BC, which is just as Greece is beginning to recover from the collapse of Mycenaean Greece. Homer twice mentions a drink that was made using cheese. The first of these is in the Iliad, which tells the story of the final weeks of the Trojan War. Hecamede is the captive serving woman of Nestor, the king of Pylos in southern Greece. She makes this drink for Nestor and the warrior Machaon, who have had a particularly tough day fighting on the battlefield, where Machaon was wounded by the Trojan prince Paris. In this cup, the woman, skilled as a goddess, mixed them a strong drink with pramnium wine. Over it shredded goat's cheese with a bronze grater and scattered barley into it, glistening pure white, then invited them to drink it when she had mulled it. In the Odyssey, the goddess Circe drugs Odysseus' men before turning them into pigs with a similar mixture of cheese, barley meal, and yellow honey flavoured with Pramnian wine. Not too long ago, Tasting History did a video based on these descriptions, and it's totally worth a watch, just for his reactions on tasting it. I'll put a link to it in the description below. As you can imagine, the combination of cheese, barley, um, honey, and wine is not really all that appetising to the modern palate. The Odyssey also contains one of the earliest descriptions of making cheese. If you're not familiar with the Odyssey, it's the story of Odysseus, king of Ithaca, and his 10-year journey home after the Trojan War, and all the adventures he encounters along the way. At one point in the story, Odysseus and his men come upon the cave of the Cyclops Polyphemus, and they decide to try and steal the flocks of sheep and goats that he keeps there. It took us very little time to reach the cave, but we did not find its owner at home. He was tending his fat sheep in the pastures. So we went inside and looked in amazement at everything. There were baskets, or racks, laden with cheese, and the folds were thronged with lambs and kids, each group, the spring ones, the summer ones, and the newborn ones, being separately penned. All his well-made vessels, the pails and bowls he used for milking, were swimming with whey. To start with, my men begged me to let them take away some of the cheeses, then come back, drive the kids and lambs quickly out of the pens, 
down to the good ship, and so set sail across the salt water. But though it would have been far better so, I was not to be persuaded. I wished to see the owner of the cave, and had hopes of some friendly gifts from my host. But when he did appear, my men were not going to find him a very likable character. We lit a fire, and made an offering to the gods, helped ourselves to some of the cheeses, and when we had eaten, sat down in the cave to await his arrival. At last he came up, shepherding his flocks and carrying a huge bundle of dry wood to burn at supper time. With a great crash, he threw this down inside the cave, giving us such a fright that we hastily retreated to an inner recess. Meanwhile, he drove some of his fat flock into the wider part of the cave, all the ones he was milking, the rams and he-goats he left out of doors in the walled yard. He then picked up a huge stone with which he closed the entrance. It was a mighty slab. Twenty-four four-wheeled wagons could not shift such a massive stone from the entrance. Such was the monstrous size of the rock with which he closed the cave. Next he sat down to milk his ewes and his bleating goats, which he did methodically, putting her young to each mother as he finished. He then curdled half the white milk, collected the whey, and stored it in wicker cheese baskets. The remainder he left standing in pails, so that it might be handy at supper time when he wanted a drink. When he had efficiently finished all his task, he relit the fire and spied us. This description of cheese making that Homer gives us only outlines part of the process. It is, after all, part of a story and not an instruction manual on making cheese. Odysseus and his men also didn't stick around long enough to see what Cyclops did next with the curds he put in the baskets. The main parts of the process described here are curdling the milk and then straining the curds in wicker baskets. Because of the time frame of this particular story, it would seem like Polyphemus is using some kind of rennet to curdle his milk, because it happens quite quickly. Polyphemus would, after all, have access to rennet with all the young sheep and goats that he has in his cave. Placing the curds in wicker baskets to drain allows the excess whey to drain off, and it looks like Polyphemus is collecting that whey in larger vats. For what reason he's collecting this is not really clear. Another thing Homer doesn't tell us is whether Polyphemus is putting any weight on the cheeses in these baskets. That would allow more whey to be drained off, and you would end up with a much firmer, harder cheese that would last longer. Odysseus and his men find cheese on racks inside the cave, which suggests that Polyphemus is aging the cheese and preserving it by letting it dry out on these racks. He would also have to somehow add salt to his cheese, both to help preserve the cheese and to improve the flavour. The easiest way to do this would be to rub salt on the outside of the cheese. This is another detail that Homer doesn't give us, because it's a story and the narrative doesn't get that far in the cheese making process. When Odysseus and his men help themselves to some of Polyphemus's cheese from the racks, they offer some of that cheese to the gods. The connection between cheese and religion is still important to the Greeks, and it will continue to be so. There is also mention of fig juice being used to curdle milk in the Iliad. The speed at which the god Paeon is able to heal the wounds of the war god Ares is described as quickly as fig juice pressed into bubbly creamy milk curdles it firm for the man who churns it round. So it looks like the Greeks could have been using both animal-based rennets and plant-based rennets, in this case from figs, in order to make cheese. Homer's works aren't primarily about cheese. They're ancient tales of heroes and the adventures and wars they are part of. But he does give us some small insights into cheese, how it was made and how it was consumed. From Homer, we've learnt that they were using both animal and plant-based rennets to make cheese, that they were draining the curds in baskets and drying their cheeses on racks. It seems that some of their cheeses were hard enough to require grating in order to be added into healing and life-restoring drinks, whether they tasted all that nice or not. Finally, there are also hints that cheese is still an important part of the religious life of these ancient Greeks, and was part of the offerings that were made to gods and goddesses. The period from around 776 to 480 BC is known as the Archaic Greek period, and this is to differentiate it from the later Classical and Hellenistic periods. By the 6th century BC, Greece had emerged from the Dark Ages, and four cities had come to dominate mainland Greece – Thebes, Athens, Corinth, and Sparta. 
It's during this period that the Sumerian goddess Inanna joins the Greek pantheon as Aphrodite. Just as the Sumerians used cheese to worship their gods and goddesses, so did the Greeks. Food offerings were part of the daily ritual at many Greek temples. Cheese-related offerings could include cheese itself, or sacrificial cakes that were layered with cheese and honey. Some Greek deities were quite picky about their cheese. The 1st century BC geographer Strabo records that the Greek goddess Athena was very fussy about the type of cheese, and she would only accept imported cheese. Only the best for Athena. In Sparta, cheeses were among the offerings made to the huntress goddess Artemis at her temple. The Spartans had an unusual tradition, which is recorded by Xenophon. Spartan boys were trained from a very early age to be warriors. This training was really harsh and restrictive, in order to prepare them for any kind of hardship that they might face as warriors. One of these restrictions was that they were fed very dull food, and often they weren't actually fed enough, and they were allowed to go hungry. This was part of the preparation for the privations of war. However, they weren't just expected to sit there and starve. They were allowed to supplement their diet by stealing from the local population and from the temples. Boys who were caught were harshly punished for being caught, but not for the act of stealing. Whatever way you look at it, there is no way that the Spartans come across as normal. Let's look at the Classical Greek period for a moment. This period runs from about 510 to 323 BC. In political terms, it's marked by external conflicts between Greece and Persia, as well as internal conflicts between Athens and Sparta. Several of the Greek islands became well known for producing and exporting cheese, including Synthos, Renea, and Chios. They shipped cheese all around the Eastern Mediterranean, including to places like Syria and Egypt. Another Greek island known for its cheese in the Classical period is Sicily. Sicilian cheese was a luxury item for the wealthy in mainland Greece. They were hard cheeses that could perhaps trace their roots back to the cheeses made by Cyclops in the Odyssey. Sicilian cuisine was admired, and cheese was a large part of that. It could be added to bread or into sauces, and it could also just be grated on top of meat or fish. Cheese wasn't just a luxury item for the wealthy, though. It was part of the everyday diet of most people, and was usually eaten as an accompaniment to the main part of the meal. At symposia, banquets that were filled with drinking, dancing, music, the reciting of literary works, and intellectual conversation, cheese and cakes filled with cheese were part of the delicacies served after the main meal. In the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great conquered an immense empire, spanning from Greece eastward across the Middle East almost all the way to India. The Hellenistic period of ancient Greece begins with the conquests of Alexander the Great, and goes all the way through to the conquest of Greece itself by Rome in 146 BC. Aristotle is a well-known Greek philosopher. He was a student of Plato, and he was also Alexander the Great's tutor. He also wrote a lot of things down, including some very interesting remarks about cheese. In his work, The History of Animals, he details the types of milk that can be used to make cheese, as well as how cheese is often made. All milk has a watery serum, which is called whey, and a substantial part called curds. The thicker kinds of milk have the most curds. The milk of animals without cutting teeth in both jaws coagulates, wherefore cheese is made from the milk of domestic animals. The milk of those with cutting teeth in both jaws does not coagulate, there is a fatness in milk which becomes oily when it is cooked. In Sicily and other countries, when there is an abundant supply of goat's milk, they mix ewe's milk with it, and it coagulates readily. Not only because it contains abundance of curd, but also because it is of a drier nature. Some animals have more milk than enough for the support of their offspring, and this is useful for making cheese, and for putting aside. The best is that of the sheep and goats, and next that of the cow. Mare's milk and ass's milk are combined with Phrygian cheese. There is more cheese in the milk of the cow than of the goat, for the shepherds say, from an aphora of goat's milk they can make 19 cakes of cheese, each worth an obolus, and 30 from cow's milk. Milk is coagulated by the juice of figs, and by rennet. The juice is placed upon wool, and the wool is washed in a little milk. This coagulates upon mixture. The rennet is a kind of milk, which is found in the body of sucking animals. 
the serenit is milk, containing cheese, for the milk becomes cooked by the heat of the body. As we saw with Homer, the Greeks were using both rennet from animals and from figs to coagulate their milk. Aristotle also used the coagulation of milk as a metaphor for how babies are made. The action of the semen of the male in setting the female's secretion in the uterus is similar to that of rennet upon milk. Rennet is milk which contains vital heat, as semen does, and this integrates the homogeneous substance and makes it set. As the nature of milk and the menstrual fluid is one and the same, the action of the semen upon the substance of the menstrual fluid is the same as that of rennet upon milk. So yeah, making babies is apparently just like making cheese. What I think Aristotle's metaphor does show is that the average Greek person had some kind of understanding of the curdling of milk. Otherwise Aristotle would not use this as an image for something they could not possibly see, the conception of a baby. So it looks like the Greeks were more or less familiar with how cheese was made, or at least the process of curdling milk, even if they weren't doing either of these things themselves. So what do we know about the ancient Greeks and their cheese? We know that they were making cheese mainly from sheep and goat's milk, and that they were using rennet to make their cheese, both animal rennet and plant-based rennet, particularly from figs. We know that cheese is still a central part of their religious worship system. There are daily offerings of cheese and cheese-based foods being made in temples throughout ancient Greece. In the unusual case of Sparta, those temple offerings are sometimes stolen by the young warriors in training in order to supplement their diet. But cheese is not just food for the gods. It's also part of the daily diet of the average Greek, as well as a central part of the raucous symposia. Cheese making also provides some quite spectacular metaphors, including the healing of wounds and how sex results in babies. Cheese is spread through pretty much every part of Greek life, and they're getting really good at making it too. They're trading cheese throughout the Mediterranean, and some of the most prized cheese from this time period comes from Greek islands. But nothing lasts forever. Over the decades after Alexander the Great's death, the empire that he founded splinters, and is challenged and defeated by a steadily expanding republic to their west, the Romans. I hope you enjoyed this episode on the cheese of ancient Greece. If you did, please consider subscribing so you don't miss the next episode where we're going to look at the cheese of ancient Rome. Please let me know in the comments if there are areas of cheese history that you would like to know more about, or if there's something that I didn't cover in this episode that you're also interested in. See you next time, cheese historians.